You happy about that? <laughs> We're going to see the king? <laughs> Amen. That's great, isn't it? Yeah. This, uh, as Bill mentioned, this is a wonderful week to perhaps read through the Passion Week in Matthew, read through it in Mark, read through it in Luke, read through it in John. That just be a wonderful thing to help us, and help you get into the, just reflect on, on what God has done for us, which is unbelievable when you think about it. I mean, you know, next week we're going to talk about the greatest miracle that ever happened in the world. And that's the resurrection of Jesus. And um, so think about that. Do some reading. Do some praying. Do some reflecting. I'm sure it will be a, a blessing to you. I thought we'd give you a rest from Samuel. Is that okay? <laughs> People are, I remember one time I was preaching through Ephesians. It took me about two years. And every once in a while, I'd, I'd say, now, please turn to the book of Ephesians. And I thought I'd hear something like, oh, God, no, no. <laughs> you know, here is he ever going to get out of this book, you know, that kind of a thing. So I've had to step it up a little, you know, and uh, do it a little bit quicker. But um, anyway, I want you to turn to uh, Matthew chapter 21, if you would. And I'll read uh, verses 1 to 11 as you uh, follow along. Matthew 21, 1 through 11. I guess that's my cue to start. <laughs> I'm not sure what, what that is. It, just don't do that when you think I need to stop, okay? <laughs> okay. Matthew 21, verse 1. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, tell him that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, placed their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth, in Galilee. Now, one of the reasons that they answered this is Jesus is because Jesus was the, basically the Hebrew name Joshua. It was a very, very common name in, the, in those days. And then they had the name the town he was from because it was so obscure. Uh, you know, people really didn't know much about Nazareth or didn't think much about it. And, you know, so that's why they, you know, made that emphasis on his name and his place. Now, this, this text shows us how Jesus wanted to be viewed. How he wanted people to see him. Because this was his first really public announcement of his messiahship. This is the first time he was going to go public with himself being the messiah. And so he wanted to make sure that they got the right idea of what this Messiah is going to look like. Now, we know that Jesus was God. Amen? We know that. They didn't know that. We know that Jesus came to save his people 
from their sins. Matthew chapter 1 in the Christmas story. They didn't know that. They were looking for someone else. They were expecting someone else, someone who would conquer the Roman Empire and get Caesar out of their hair. That's what they were looking for. And it wasn't him. And it wasn't going to happen, at least not at this time. It is going to happen sometime, though. But not at this time. So this text shows us another very, very important thing that's very, very important to every church. And that is Jesus is both human and divine. And, and the church needs to preach that and, and, and help, the peop- help people to understand how significant that is. Because if you don't preach that Jesus is human and divine, then you're going to tilt somewhere between spiritualisticness or spiritualism and secularism. So that balance has to be known and it has to be taught uh, in the church. Now, when I read this, when I read this text, and I know there are some scholars that think this way, I, but and I'm not a scholar. Okay, <laughs> let's get that straight. Uh, But I I thought to myself, where were you people when everybody was yelling, crucify him? How come there wasn't somebody on one side of the road, you know, no, it's it's the Messiah, it's the son of David, it's it's our deliverer, he's our savior. How come, you know? And I think probably the reason was they they didn't get the Messiah they wanted. Sometimes we feel that way. Well, why hasn't Jesus done this for me? Why hasn't Jesus helped me during this time? Why hasn't Jesus, you know, sometimes we don't get the Savior we want. And yet our, our listen, our, <clears throat> our only real salvation in those kind of times is to never stop trusting in Jesus. Don't ever stop trusting in him. That'll be your salvation and mine. Now, the first thing that pops out of this text is the reference to the Mount of Olives. Um, it says in Zechariah 14.4, on that day his feet will stand upon the Mount of Olives. And the Messianic Jews, Messianic Jewish faith, connected, with the, connected the Mount of Olives with the coming of Jesus. And what Matthew does is he takes that geographical place, Mount of Olives, and basically he's saying, he's here. <laughs> he is here. Your Messiah is here. Now, I know the Zechariah passage refers to the second coming. But it's no accident, I don't believe, it's no accident that Jesus comes from the Mount of Olives. And that's what Matthew is trying to tell us here, that your Messiah is here, and he came from the direction and then from, actually, the Mount of of olives. Now, the second thing that pops out here, and it's easy to skip over this, I think, is that Jesus sends two disciples. Two disciples. Which basically means he's kept his discipleship mentoring the same all the way through his ministry. If you read Luke chapter 10, I think it's right at the first verse that Jesus sends out another 72. And then after 72, it says, quote, two by two. And and it's kind of interesting, if you'll keep your finger here and just flip back to Matthew 10, where we have a list of the men that he chose. In Matthew chapter 10, I think it's verse 2 also. Yeah, let's read verse 1 as well. He called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out evil spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. There, um, these are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, Peter, Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew, James, Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon, Zealot, Judas. 
I didn't read that right, did I? No, and I want you to notice the ands, the A-N-D-S's, okay? Because it says, first Simon and his brother Andrew, James the son of Zebedee and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, John son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon and Zelda and Judas Iscariot. I'm just wondering if those weren't the pairs he sent out. And that's the way he sent them out. You know, Peter and Andrew, his brother, James and John, brothers. But the ands tell us that the discipleship method of Jesus is two by two. Now, that's extremely important to the life of the church. Extremely important. When you recruit Christian workers, you need to think two instead of one. You need to think two people to do ministry instead of one. Now, I've been listening to Bill up the Grove for like since September. <laughs> looking for youth workers. Looking for other workers. I'm just hoping sometime before I leave this place that he'll get some. And can I just remind you that you weren't saved so that you can just sit there? So you can sit, soak, and sour, as the old saying goes. Now, Jesus saved you to serve. Somebody needs to step up here on this Christian worker deal. But again, try to get two, amen? Have anybody ever been left in ministry for a long time by themselves? <laughs> yeah, you don't even want to admit it. That's the problem. Dear friends, we, 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 we recruit people and say, hey, have a great day, and never come back and put them in a place of ministry we're not even sure they know how to do it and then just leave and never check on them or anything else. And they, they die in there. They burn out. Some of them burn out and never come back again. Sorry. But Jesus saved you to serve. And hopefully, when whoever recruits you, recruit you, they'll recruit two of you. I'm going to read a passage from uh, the fourth chapter of Ecclesiastes that says this, verses 9 to 12. Two are better than one. <laughs> I can stop right there. Because they have a good return of their work. If one falls down, his friend can help him up. But pity the man who falls and has no help, no one to help him up. Also, if two lie down together, they keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not easily broken. Your Christian workers need help. They need help. So think two and not just one. Now, the whole securing, go back to Matthew uh, 21. The securing of the donkeys uh, is an interesting thing. It can be interpreted actually or explained either naturally or supernaturally. For instance, the natural explanation would be that Jesus may have gotten the donkey's owners permission ahead of time. That may be the way he did it. I don't know. I actually think it was done supernaturally. I really do. I really think Jesus, Jesus enables and he knows and, and, and powerfully and ahead of time, he knows what will happen. And by his supernatural powers, he gets these donkeys. And he rides in to Jerusalem on them. In fact, most commentators opt for the supernatural, and I really agree. But did you notice the phrase... The Lord needs him? The Lord needs a donkey? Really? Yeah. And, and, and there, there's another variation in the, one of the most beautiful themes in the Bible, which is this, who Jesus is. Who is he? He's the Lord. He's divine. He's God come in the flesh. He took that on for me and you. Me and you. 
so he could identify with us and understand all the things that we go through. And so that he could help you and me when we go through all of these things. He's God come in the flesh. But he's also flesh. (laughs) He's also human. That's where the word needs comes in. He needs these donkeys. But it's much more than that. It's so much more than that, that that he would, what does Philippians say? Leave, basically, his glory. Not, didn't say, listen, I can't, I can't go. You know, I got this position, you know, here in glory. It's, I, I like it. You know, it's, it's, it's cool. You know, and, you know, I'm just staying. But somewhere along the line in the wisdom of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, which we sang about this morning, he said, I'm going. And I'm going because they need saving. And I'm going because they need help. He's the God-man who came to this earth. Are you ready? Everybody look up here. For you. For you. Now, let's look at verses 4 and 5 here. Matthew uses two Old Testament passages and brings them together to show that Jesus fulfilled the Hebrew Scriptures. The first one, say to the daughter of Zion, is from Isaiah uh, chapter 62. I think it's 62, 11 or something like that. That's the first one. The second phrase is from Zechariah 9. And it says, See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a coat, the foal of a donkey. So the, the New Testament writers were notorious for doing this. Take a verse here, take a verse here, put them together. This is what happened. And that's exactly what Matthew did. Now, Jesus knew these prophecies. In fact, he was wowing, he was wowing the teachers at about when he was about twelve. Remember that story? You know, they were looking all over for him, and he was down in there, you know, uh, just debating with the teachers on Old Testament truth and who God is and so forth. So he knew Isaiah, he knew Zechariah, but he, he fulfilled it because. He fulfilled it because it perfectly expressed his conception of Messiahship. And the Messiahship that he wanted to express is a lowly conception. A humble Messiahship. A loving and kind, down-to-earth Messiahship. And when you read the life of Jesus, you see that day in and day out. You know, you see that day in and day out. So he puts into action and and he instructs us and his people visually with the truth of who he is and how he wants to be who he is. You You understand that? Not only who he is, but how he wants to be who he is and how he wants to be is humble and peaceful. Even to the point of humbling himself to the cross and to the wrath of God. That's hard to take take in. (laughs) It, it, It really is, but it's the absolute truth. Now, one of my favorite old dead guys is Luther, Martin Luther, who began, of course, the reformation of the church uh, in about the 1500s. He he catches the evangelical message here of this passage. Let me, it's a little bit of a long quote, but try to stay with me, okay? Here we go. Luther says this, the gospel wants to entice us to faith above all else. But no one can accept this gracious Christ unless he believes that he is a man 
and adopts the opinion of him that the evangelist gives. So Matthew is saying, this is what Jesus is like. What we are to say, yeah, I believe that. I believe that. And anywhere else we're reading the gospel, we need to say, I believe that. He goes on to say, he is presented as sheer grace, humility, and goodness. And whoever believes that of him is blessed. Look at him. He rides no stallion, which is a war animal. He comes not with fearful pomp and power, but sits on a donkey, which is not a war animal, but which is ready for burdens of work that will help human beings. I thought that was a great analogy. Dear friends, what do donkeys do? They work. What do donkeys do? They help. What are you and I supposed to do? We're supposed to work. And we're supposed to help other people. That's why Jesus is our example. Thereby he shows that he does not come to terrify people or drive or oppress them, but to help them and carry their burdens and take them on himself. Let's hear it from Martin Luther, amen? Yeah, good old dead guy or not. You know, yeah. Amazing theologian. When Alexander the Great came into Jerusalem, he was actually going to destroy Jerusalem. If I remember the story correctly, and I can't remember whether it's true or legend or whatever, but he had a dream about Jerusalem and, and about conquering Jerusalem. But a, a, a really, I want to say, a really um, smart, for one of a better word, um, Hebrew leader met, met him. And he told, he told Alexander the Great, I had a dream too about you coming to Jerusalem. And the interesting thing was that Alexander the Great was so impressed with that dream that he never destroyed Jerusalem. Yeah. Never destroyed it. But here he came. When he did come, he came on a white horse. He came on a war stallion. He came on the best horse and, you know, the kind of horse where you didn't want to go near. You ever see those kind of horses? I've not been around horses long, but when a horse comes in doing this, you know, and stepping high, I'm not going over there. Okay? And neither was anybody else, you know. Yeah. But Jesus didn't. He didn't do that. Jesus rides into Jerusalem on a donkey. And listen, the donkey is a sign of peace. The war horse is a sign of war. And Jesus comes in. He's a peaceful Messiah. But again... It wasn't the kind of peace that the people were looking for. Turn to Romans chapter 5, if you would, for just a moment. Here's the kind of peace Jesus was going to bring. In Romans chapter 4, the apostle just talks about how we're saved and how we're justified. And that is through Christ and his death and resurrection. And he says, therefore, in chapter 5 and verse 1, therefore, since we've been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into the, in this grace in which we now stand and which we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. There's the peace that Jesus was bringing, peace between you and me, and God, or what we call salvation. Dear friends, there's only one way you can be saved. There's only one way you'll ever find peace in your life, and that's through Jesus, who said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. It's the only way. Now, I don't know about you. I didn't take a long time. In fact, I grew up and, and I, didn't know, I didn't know anything about Jesus. I, I'm telling you, I just didn't know anything. 
And for a while, when people would approach me about Jesus, I'd get real resistant. You know, I, I wasn't real happy about knowing that I was a sinner. I, of course, I don't know why I didn't admit it. I knew I was. You know, no one really had to convince me, Frank, you're a sinner. Are you kidding me? You know, I knew. But I, I didn't resist too long, but there are people who continue and continue to resist God and resist Jesus. And you, and you may be here this morning and, and you don't think you need him, but oh, you really do. You need him more than anything else in your life. Now, hear this for me, will you? And, and, and as humbly as I can say it and as loving as I can say it, one day Jesus is going to ride in on a war horse. Yeah. One day he's going to ride in on a war horse and he's going to fight all who fight against him and he's going to fight all who resist him. And believe me, as somebody said, you don't want to box with God. You won't win. Look at this in Revelation chapter 19. Just turn over there. Leave your hand in... Uh, or you're not in Matthew, are you? We'll get back there. Revelation 19. Verse 11. Revelation 19, 11. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With judges, justice, he judges and makes war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven are following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Out of his mouth comes a sharp sword, which is to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of of, of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Soon and very soon, we're going to see the King. Amen? Yeah. Sooner the better, amen? <laughs> Sooner the better. But he's coming. And, and dear friend... Again, my, my invitation to you this morning is if you're resisting Jesus, don't do that. Pray that he'll show you who he really is and pray that he'll give you faith to trust in him. Now, go back to Matthew 21. In between... Those two prophecies, the one from Isaiah and the one from Zechariah, uh, Matthew left out a phrase. I, I suppose we should turn to Zechariah, huh? Uh, turn to Zechariah 9. It's actually just one book back before Malachi, okay? So just kind of back up on your pages and you'll hit Zechariah. And in chapter 9... We'll read Zechariah 9 9. How many of you are there? How many of you are lost? <laughs> All right. I think it's Zephaniah, Zechariah, Malachi, something like that. That's the way it goes. Zechariah 9 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See your king comes to you riding and having. Righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey. Matthew doesn't put in that in that in his prophecy or in his uh, the one he applied to Jesus. He didn't put in righteous and having salvation. He left that out. I go, why would he leave that out? Because Jesus is certainly speaking of salvation, but the problem is Zechariah wasn't speaking of spiritual salvation. In, the, in that sense, he was speaking of the salvation of Israel from its enemies. A victorious salvation. Some people translate that triumphant and victorious. But that wasn't Jesus' approach. 
That's not his approach until he comes again. His approach is humble, peaceful, loving, kind. That's who Jesus is. And they didn't get that kind of Messiah that they wanted. They didn't, they didn't get the, the conqueror. They didn't get the Caesar out of their hair. What they got was a humble Messiah riding in on a donkey, the sign of peace. Now I want to just um, close with the, talking about the Hosannas for a minute, okay? <clears throat> the first one says, Hosanna to the son of David. Now that phrase is usually viewed as like an acclamation, a, a kind of a praise, kind of like um, God save the queen <laughs> or something like that. That, that's, that's, that's probably the most popular interpretation of that phrase. But look at, look at the next one, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest is a prayer. It's a prayer for God's salvation. In fact, that's what Hosanna means. Actually, Hosanna literally means save, please. That's what it literally means in Hebrew. Save, please. So here the people are saying to God, save us. Save us. A, a prayer kind of like, God, do it in the highest. That is, pull out the stops. Pull out all the stops and save us. Pull out the, the stops. Save us in the highest way you can. Say, or we would say, it, save us in the deepest way that you can. And that's what they're praying for. We might translate this, save us in the best way possible. Guess what? He did. <laughs> he saved us in the best way possible. He saved us through the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus. There is no better way <laughs> to be saved. That prayer is answered even though they didn't know. That prayer was answered. And everybody who trusts in Jesus, everybody who trusts in Jesus, he saves them from the terrors of death and sometimes the terrors of life as you, some of the people are probably going through some right now. And only through Jesus can we be saved. Uh, Jerome, was, Jerome was another good old dead guy. Can I, can I quote him? Good. He, he was an early church father. And he believed save in the highest meant save not only human beings, but save the whole world. And I, I kind of like that. Because it gives saved in the highest possibly two meanings. One is saved by your highest means, saved by your best way, which we know is Jesus. And the other is saved the, to the remotest ends. And, and, and we prayed for that this morning. Did you, you didn't catch it, did you? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Are you ready? Thy kingdom come. Jesus is going to save the world every, every bit of it. And you read that in the book of Revelation, chapter 21 or 22, I can't remember right off the top of my head. I saw coming down out of heaven a new heaven and a new earth. We sang it, no more dying there. No more sickness there. None. Oh, won't you be so glad? I mean, I can't hardly turn on the news anymore. I can't hardly watch a kid from Syria starving to death. I can't hardly watch another bombing of, of ISIS. I can't hardly... 
And I say, sometimes I say, dear God, when are you going to end this? When are you going to end this? But I have to trust in Jesus, don't I? I have trust in him, his timing. I think he's late. I probably might. I might want to duck here. You know. Yeah. But he's not. He's not. And in a few moments, we're going to remember that Jesus said this to you and me. This is my body, which is broken for you. And he said this. This is my blood, which is shed for you. And we need to rejoice and celebrate that as we take communion this morning. Let's pray. Again, Lord, our hearts are full of thanksgiving for wonderful passages like this in your word. And we're humbled even with the privilege of trying to teach it and preach it. And we know that you could do it much more better than I can and any preacher can. But we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name.